uh, well, Ian and I will be signing books at 2 p.m. So my book is aimed at beginners who want to learn data wrangling. Um, if you're not a beginner, don't wait in line because uh, my goal is to have more new Pythonistas, so I don't really want to deal with you people that are doing Python all the time with data. Uh, so that's a, a, a mantra of mine, and Ian's is aimed at, you know, you're already doing data or you're already doing scale with Python and you want to speed it up even faster, then you can wait in line for Ian's book, and we'll have like a face-off of whose line can get bigger and things like that. So. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> uh, it's multi-processing. Come on in. Okay, so we're going to talk about data cleaning with Python, and we're going to go into a little bit of how you can automate it now, and maybe some a bit of how you can automate it in the future. So my name is Catherine Jarmel. People often know me as KJAM on the internet. I've been working with Python since 2008. Uh, you can find me at KJAM, and my website is KJAMistan. Uh, which is the name of my company. Uh, I helped form the first Pi Ladies group in 2011 in Los Angeles. So if you want to talk about diversity in tech or uh, whatnot, then we can have a chat. And I really want to thank the organizers for having such a diverse audience here. It feels really nice. OK, so I feel like we need to have a conversation because I go to these conferences and I go to all these talks on data. And very, very few people are talking about data cleanup. We're all presenting our really nice models, and everything looks perfect. We've already done all the pre-processing, and nobody's talking about the really messy bits. And unfortunately, this is where we spend quite a lot of our time. So I really want to have a conversation about why we aren't talking about it more. I also want to thank this organizing committee, because there's a few talks in this conference about it. So here is a comic that I found on sexy data. And I'm not the only person that de deals with abnormal data sets. So how many people here have dealt with completely normalized data that needed very little pre-processing in the past six months? Yeah, OK. And the rest of us are stuck with what? So not all of us have these wonderful, sexy bell curves. Here's some real data. So this is some real, just a snapshot of some real data from 311 calls, which is essentially information and city calls in New York. And we can see it's messy. There's quite a lot of unspecified fields. There's Latin longs in string tuples. There's a bunch of different nulls. And there's daytime strings not properly formatted. So this is not easy to parse automatically. Real data is often in silly formats, like PDFs. This is a PDF table. I hate PDFs. But government continues to release data in PDFs. So for example, for my book, this is a UNICEF PDF. And we had to use several different tools to get the data out of it and into a usable form. So if you're dealing with government data sets or nonprofit data sets, a lot of times you're unfortunately dealing with PDFs. And that's a really good time. And real data is often, especially government data, in a variety of formats, maybe with some of them there, some of them not. So these are some bloodline files from Data UK. And what it says here at the bottom, sorry, the text is a bit small, is please note that some data sets are not available in all formats. So good luck. You're going to have to download them all, look through the data, and figure out, hey, what's going to work for me? So these are real data problems. So I'm going to read a bit of a quote I found while I was doing some research on this topic. According to a paper from the University of Edinburgh on the topic of data quality, statistics show that bad data can cost businesses 20 to 30 percent of their operating revenue, and that poor data across businesses and government in the United States cost the economy $3.1 trillion per year. So that's just the United States economy. When we think about it in the UK and Europe and Asia and everywhere else that people are parsing data for business, then we can see that this is a global problem and it's costing people a lot of time and a lot of money. And your time and money is most likely for your startup better used for using your mind to actually solve the problems. And a lot of times we're doing it wrong. So this is another example of some real data wrangling. It's a really great paper called Towards Reliable Interactive Data Cleaning. And it's basically a survey of data scientists and data engineers. And they went around and they wanted to ask people, what are you actually doing in the field? And these are academics. So of course, they have some really great questions. And then the data scientists are like, what are you talking about? So in this case, 
One consultant from a large database vendor noted, most of the errors are subtle enough that the analysis will go through with standard null value semantics of SQL, but give an incorrect answer. And usually this is only caught weeks later after someone notices something like, well, the Wilmington branch cannot have one million sales in a week. So these are things that happen all the time. I hear people's stories. I have experienced it myself. The report goes through fine. It goes to whoever it uh, needs to go to. But there's been no test of actual data quality. And by data quality, we're talking about you know, the accuracy of our data. Did the script go through fine? Did the pipeline complete OK? Did the query complete OK? Yeah, great. OK, moving on. And that's not a very good job on our part. Here's some other quotes from that same paper. So this question was, how do you determine whether the data is sufficiently clean to trust the analysis? Other than common sense, we do not have a procedure to do this. Or we usually do not do vigorous validation of data cleaning. Another quote in there just said, I use my area of expertise. I use my own personal expertise to determine that it's valid. Right, so these are real problems. And again, I'm not trying to say anything about these data scientists or the way that they're solving their problems, because I think, honestly, it's the way a lot of us are solving these problems. Like, oh, it makes sense. We don't have a lot of other ways to test or validate that what we're doing is actually answering the question that we're trying to answer. So how should we evaluate our data quality? We need to make sure it's valid. We need to have trustworthy sources. We need to make sure that we have valid types. We want to make sure that it's accurate. We want to make sure that we've dealt with any conversions and units of measure in a proper way. We want to make sure there's not duplicates or other messy data that's going to uh, lead to problems down the line. It should be complete. So we're not dealing with a completely null data set or a data set that has quite a lot of nulls lurking in it. It needs to be consistent. So this is particularly true if you're dealing with a distributed system and you're going to go query this database, you want to make sure it's consistent with the other databases. It needs to be uniform, right? We have the same units. We have a consistent way that we name things. We have consistent categories. And it needs to be repeatable. So if I run it today, and then I have to rerun it on the same data set, let's say something got lost, or I, uh, we have some stragglers, whatever the problem is, I rerun it, it should have the same repeatable process with the same data inputs. So if you're missing any of these in your final evaluation, or if you're just not simply not evaluating this at all in your data pipelining or in your data cleanup, then that's something that you need to address. So ETL does not have to equal FML. Um, so this extract, transform, load pipelines do not have to mess up your entire process. I feel like we are usually making it harder on ourselves because I feel like we're constantly rolling something new. Like, ah, I have this great idea. I'm going to build a new data pipeline that does it this way or that way. And I think that what we can use instead is use the open source tools that are available and use the libraries that are available and start to build up on what we already have there, start to share our own pipelines and our own data cleaning process and move from beyond there. And there's also some really great research I'll be covering a little bit later in the talk on how to go about that. So uh, before we get to the complete optimal solution and what's happening in all of the research around machine learning, uh, we're going to go through some libraries with some different data problems. And I'm just going to basically give you a whirlwind choose your own dirty data adventure tour. And we're going to say, OK, do you, are you dealing with this problem? There are these libraries to help. After that, then we'll go a little bit more into automation and machine learning with your data cleanup. So if you're dealing with duplicates, there's a great tool called Dedupe, and it's made by the DataMade team. They're based in Chicago, and they're focused mainly around open data and uh, data journalism, if you will. And they have some really great uh, matching. It's based on uh, a, a simple neural network. Uh, it has really great documentations, and the team is really open to new features. So uh, I contacted them on Twitter with some questions about some examples, and they were really responsive. So I think that you can always reach out to them if they don't have something that you're looking for. From this same data made team, they also have address parsing and name parsing. So right now, the address parsing only deals with US-based addresses. But again, as I said, I think they're very open to issues and to working with others. Um, I also think that all documentation should now contain uh, GIFs because, yeah, 
it's pretty awesome, and you have to type. Uh, you're forcing your users to type, which I think is really great. <laughs> uh, for string matching, uh, if you need to find duplicates and clean, so this is particularly if you have a lot of large documents and you're trying to look, you know, entity extraction and then from entity extraction do string matching. Uh, what you can use is you can use jellyfish for phonetic matching. So this is really great in terms of transcripts or if you're worried about spelling mistakes. And then you can use Fuzzy Wuzzy, which is one of my favorite libraries to do string matching. And that does both token and string matching, and it can also do it from a set of choices. If you're willing to use R, or if you're already using R, uh, there is a great library called Fuzzy Join, which essentially tries to do data frame joins uh, with R. If you're dealing with privacy issues or patient data, if you have customer data that you need cleaned, you can use Scrub-a-Dub. So what this is going to do is it's going to go through your data set. It's going to essentially remove all personally identifiable information, so names and things like that. And then what it's going to do is it's going to give you markers, um, IDs that you can utilize. So if you do have to deal with medical data, or if you do have to deal with uh, customer data and you want it anonymized, then this is uh, one great tool for you. If you have weird units or you're dealing with conversions, then I highly recommend taking a look at Pint. Um, if you want to know what five quid is worth today in euros, then you can use the currency converter. So um, you can follow that along and then maybe like afterwards go back to Pint or buy yourself a Pint. That's fine. And if you're dealing with dates and you're completely sick of date time or you're sick of trying to figure out how to make date time time zone aware, uh, then I highly recommend looking at Aero. And uh, it does uh, support many different formats. It supports ISO 8601, which is Ian's favorite thing. And we should all use it because Ian says we should. So um, take a look at Arrow, though. It really has some great parsing tools. And having the ability to change time zones with one simple method is uh, very useful if you're dealing with, let's say, a distributed system and they're not all UTC. So speaking of Ian, did you know that he cares about data cleaning too? So if you have resumes or job posting or company names or other business speak, Ian actually built a tool. He has a repo for it and uh, a beta sign up at annotate.io. So you can bother him for new features. You're welcome. And then if you're dealing with tables and PDFs, and you need Pi3 compatible. So PDF tables is my favorite library, and I'm going to butcher its name, but Vyacheslav Nadenov, I'm really sorry, uh, helped uh, migrate this Python 2 only library into Python 3 when I met up with him at EuroPython this past year. And what it does is it does really nice table extraction. Um, and you can simply pip install it, and it's magical. I highly recommend using it if you have to do with tables inside PDFs. Do nulls have you or your means down? Ha ha ha. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, so if you're tired of dealing with nulls, there's a bunch of different uh, libraries that can help. A lot of these are based around pandas or data frames or other things like that. So you might first need to get your data in a state where you can move it into pandas. Then you can use Data Cleaner, Dora, or Badfish. They all try to do a little bit different things. So Data Cleaner tries to essentially um, repair those missing data um, by imputing values. Uh, Dora is really interesting because it's based around machine learning for your data sets. So it does quite a lot of feature extraction and then some different ways of dealing with missing data when you're doing feature extraction. One really nice thing about Dora, too, is you can do snapshots. Mm -hmm. So essentially, you can get your data to a partially clean state, take a snapshot, uh, clean it further, take another snapshot, and then do some comparisons with your machine learning data on uh, using the different snapshots. So that's really great. And Badfish is relatively new, but it looks interesting. It actually tries to find trends and grouping within your missing data. So maybe then you can repair earlier in the pipeline. So if you can notice that you're missing constantly missing groups of data in a particular pattern, then this can maybe help repair why that data is missing. So I recommend taking a look. And spelling and grammar is hard. Um, there's a ton of APIs available for this. Um, Tatiana is giving a talk tomorrow on this, on using machine learning to deal with spelling. And there's also a pretty interesting article uh, on approaching it with a long, short-term memory 
uh, network for deep learning and training your own network on spelling mistakes. So this might be best if, say, you don't have English language only, uh, then it might be best to use and train your own model. Okay, so now we're going to move. Those are a little bit of the simple, out of the box, you pip install, and then you can start working with them, or conda install, whatever you're doing these days. Um, so now we're going to go to more advanced, not out of the box. So this is going to require you to do a little bit of tooling on your own, and it's going to require you to think about the problem. So if you already have a data team and you already have the means to go about taking on these projects, I say use these tools. If you don't, then I would approach with caution because you definitely want to be using your time in the best way possible. So again, by the data made team, this is basically what their address parsing and their uh, probable people parsing is based off of. This is building your own parse radar. So again, they have a very simple network. It's a, a very simple neural network. What that you do is they specify exactly how you need to build your samples, and then you can train your model and see how it works. Uh, they have a lot of great documentation on it, so especially if you're new to machine learning or you haven't done a lot of machine learning, then this is a great tool to get started with some data parsing. Uh, again, I don't really recommend building your own parser unless you absolutely have to. So for topic identification and extraction with NLP, you can use uh, Gensim, and Lev is here if you have questions about it. Uh, there's some great tutorials online. I also highly recommend taking a, looking, a look at Spacey, which is another uh, player in the space, so to speak, of NLP topic extraction. But let's say you, know, you have a series, uh, you have all this messy text, you want to extract a certain amount of information from it. You can use TF-IDF to do that. And then let's say you need to do clustering around those topic extractions or you want to do clustering around other different natural language data that you have, you can use LDA or LSI to do so. And both of those libraries have various implementations of each. I recommend taking a look through the documentation, maybe experimenting. If you're new to NLP and machine learning, then take some time playing with each and uh, be patient with yourself. There's quite a lot of academic literature that we'll get to in a minute that's dealing with extracting information from knowledge bases. So this isn't a thing I've seen often uh, within the Python community, but I definitely wanted to put it on our radar. There's one knowledge base called ConceptNet5, which is essentially a subset of DBpedia and then is also crowdsourced. It's multilingual and is being managed by a team of researchers at MIT. It's available, again, in multiple languages, and you can download it in a flat file, a SQLite database, or a Docker. And what it does is you're going to be able to extract some of these connections. So here, for example, we have saxophone is used for jazz. So if you need to do, let's say, information extraction from a series of uh, documents, then what you want to do is you want to do some knowledge base extraction to determine relationships between the information or the topics that you extracted. You can use something like a knowledge base to do so. This is going to add that extra information for your data cleanup, and this is going to allow you to use some interesting things when you start thinking about functional dependencies or requirements. So another knowledge base, of course, is DBpedia. And then there's Yago, which is called yet another great ontology. Uh, these are really, really massive data sets, so you need to think about that and think about if it's worthwhile for your data cleaning problems. But if so, you can use SURF and RDF Alchemy. These are Python clients that you can use to communicate with resource description frameworks, or RDFs. So that's what these are. And they have their own query language called Sparkle. Um, so rather than learn Sparkle, you can use one of these Python clients and write, yeah, of course, if you want to, you can learn Sparkle and write your own Sparkle queries with these Python clients, but they've actually extracted some of the really nice ways. So you can think of it like this. Uh, if I were to describe Cardiff or if I wanted Cardiff in my data set, I might say um, select star where is city of Wales founded before 1800, right? And so you can start to think about using knowledge base in your queries to do some, not only selection of your data, but to add some of this extra information without having to have people on your team go scrape something uh, and determine what to do. So if you want all the things in one package, um, I don't often recommend that, but if, if you're into that sort of thing, then you can use pattern. 
So what Pattern essentially tries to do is it tries to do pretty much everything with data mining. So it has a series of data mining, uh, web scraping. Here we have an example of Twitter scraping. And then it has some simple machine learning and neural networks built in. So here, for example, uh, in about 12 or 15 lines of Python, they're training a neural network on some Twitter data and then using that for um, semantic analysis, right? And uh, I, I wouldn't recommend this. I gave a long talk at EuroPython on how to, how to do sentiment analysis. Uh, so if you're interested, you can look that up. But yeah, normally you wouldn't want to do sentiment analysis this way, but if you just need a simple way of approaching it, then Pattern has quite a lot of features. So now we're going to talk about academics. Uh, and of course, that's some John Cleese. That would be great. Um, so what are academics talking about? Um, it's quite different, as usual, from what's going on in the industry. So we're going to go through that. So in preparation for this talk, I took a big dive into reading recent and also older literature around uh, data cleaning, information extraction, data parsing, irregularity reduction. And there's quite a lot of different things going on, and there's a, there's a very long history. So some of the papers that I came across were written by IBM in the 90s, um, talking about how they do uh, string matching and string extraction. Um, there's quite a lot that you can read if you're interested, um, but I'll try to give you a summary of some of the interesting things I found. So I think when we think of string and token distance, um, at least I do or did before I started reading about it, we kind of think of it as a solved problem, right? right? We have a few different equations that we can use. We use them to determine string distance and say, okay, these strings are matching or not matching or similar enough or not similar enough. But what I found when I was reading through the literature is that there's still quite a lot of active research around this. Now, this paper is from 2003, but it's cited in several papers because people are talking about this a lot when they're doing topic extraction or when they're doing topic clustering. And uh, it found that depending on if you're using character level extraction, so you're going to compare character by character in your tokens. If you're doing token extraction, you're comparing uh, sets of tokens to one another or if you're doing what they call a hybrid approach, which is essentially trying to determine which tokens are the same, then cluster those, and then compare across those tokens, uh, then you, it's not just all uh, Levenstein distance. So what they found here is uh, a series, and I'll post these slides so you can take a look at them. There's some more information on them. But what they found is that this is not a simple solved problem. They used census data here to do some comparisons, and it has quite a lot of irregularities. So if you, uh, this is again from 2003, but they found that when they introduced SVM or support vector machines, then this changed the accuracy even more. So what they were able to then find is, uh, depending on what models they were using and how they were training them on their textual data from the census, uh, they could get quite a, a jump in accuracy using a support vector machine alongside their distance learning model. So it's an interesting paper to read. I recommend taking a look at it. If you're dealing with a lot of strings and you're dealing with string matching and string distance, then you know it's not just a solved problem. It's not simply that we just use uh, Levenstein distance and move along with our lives. Another really, really great paper uh, is called Continuous Data Cleaning. And it was published in 2014. What they did is they used a series of functional constraints. So this there's quite a lot of literature in this uh, topic field on functional constraints. So essentially I'm going to say uh, I have these, this database or I have this data set and I'm saying that these, these fields are dependent on these other fields. So I have zip codes and every zip code is matched to only one state, right? Or every zip code is matched to only one city. And uh, what they're doing with this is then they're using a machine learning model to go through and determine when data is in there how to fix it Right? Should I change the city? Should I change the zip code? Whatever it is. Or is the functional dependency actually wrong? So at this point in time, they can say, OK, let's say you have, that, you have your functional dependency on zip codes and cities. And then let's say you add a different nation. And that nation has some matching zip codes, but it doesn't have the same cities. Right? So then your functional constraint is actually incorrect. And what they did is they were able to find that they got nearly 90% accuracy when they were able to determine, okay, which, 
which needs to be changed, or is my functional constraint broken? And then when they had low confidence, what they would do is they would prompt the user. And they would say, hey, I'm having trouble determining if this is right or not. And the user, every day when they would log into the data warehousing system, would get a series of questions saying, yes, this is right, or no, and type in or select from a series of examples which one is right. So this is some interesting work that's happening in using a combination of machine learning and users to do data cleaning that's actually going to work for your system, where you're not constantly maintaining these functional constraints just from your own code, right? Sean Goldberg and a few other researchers at the University of Florida built a system called CASEL. And what this is essentially doing is it's doing information extraction with machine learning and with crowd learning. So essentially what they're going to do is they do a series of information extraction and annotation using knowledge bases like DVpedia. At that point in time, they try to determine constraints. They try to determine, OK, these relationships are, are as such from the knowledge base that I've annotated my data set with. And then when they have low confidence or when they see mismatch constraints, so for example, there's one set of constraints from these documents and a different set of constraints with another documents, they go to the crowd and they say, hey, can you tell me, does this, does this constraint make sense? Does it not? And this is using you know, s uh, simple uh, mechanical Turk or other systems like that to then go and, and add some human annotated data. As, as you can probably imagine, this doesn't scale that well. Um, but here's also another example of information extraction with crowd learning. Uh, this is the Katara system, which is simil similar to Castle. But what we can see here is we have um, some information extraction around football players. Uh, the knowledge base, which is the KB, has validated that data and with the functional constraints. At that point in time, we ask the crowd and we say, OK, uh, is this right? And in one case, it is right. And then in another case, it's not. Because, for example, in the left case, uh, the player is from South Africa and, or, or sorry, is playing for South Africa, and South Africa has the same capital. And in the other case, the player is playing for Italy, but where he, the capital of where he's from is Madrid. Right? So we can see here that by asking the crowd to validate the sources that we have pulled from our knowledge base, that we can then add some of uh, add and manipulate and change our functional constraints, and uh, then that that gives us a more powerful system. So one of the most interesting projects I came across in my research was Sample Clean or Active Clean, and what this is doing is it's using crowdsourcing, machine learning, and sampling on large data sets. And what they found here, what I wanted to illustrate is that they found that a lot of data scientists are doing this iterative approach to data cleaning. So we go grab all of the data, right? And then we clean a portion of it. Um, and then we build a model on that. And then maybe we clean another portion of it and we build a model on that. And what they actually found is this is an awful idea um, because we can see here on the left-hand side that I have the, the dirty data model is the X's and the true model is the blue line. And I'd actually have a better fit model if I stayed with the completely dirty data model than if I cleaned a few of my data points and I get a completely mit, mismatched line, right? Um, so when you're, when you're dealing with machine learning and you're dealing with big data sets and, mis, you know, and it's very messy, um, what they're trying to do is create an iterative approach to your data cleanup so that you're not just picking a chunk, approaching it, cleaning a little bit of it, and building a completely broken model unbeknownst to you. So particularly if you're using classification or clustering, this is important. So what they did, this is a little bit of pseudocode from their paper, and they actually have quite a lot of great code available both uh, in their repository and also in their paper. But what they essentially attempt to do is they're using statistics to analyze how dirty the data set is and how abnormal right, your data is. Then what they're doing is you're building a model iteratively on taking a a sample that's informed by statistics and the distribution of your data. And then at that point in time, you can iterate on that until you've reached a point. So you can set a series of points of, of breaks or exit, right? Um, if you want to, that can be based on time or based on data processed, but it can also be based on statistical measurements of how your data is now dispersed now that you've cleaned a section or a sample. And I think this is really 
when I, as I was reading this, I think this is really the future of where this type of large data set cleaning or data wrangling or data munging where it needs to go. Because we cannot keep building pipeline after pipeline after pipeline and relying on ourselves to do the statistical analysis steps in between each bit. Um, we can use machine learning, we can use advances in machine learning, we can use um, simple statistics, really, to determine how is my data structured, how do I then choose the, the error-prone parts alongside some of the less error-prone parts and build a model that I can actually use and I can trust. So if you want to check out some academic code, fair warning, it's all Java, because of course. Um, Big Dancing is a really cool system. Um, it's called Nadif as well, which I'm sure I'm pronouncing incorrectly, but um, that's uh, clean in Arabic. Uh, that one's available for download. The pre-Castle uh, database that they built is called CamelDB, but it does some of the same crowdsourcing annotations. And then Sample Clean, which is related to the Active Clean project, is also available for download. So I recommend, especially if you know, know Java and you can read through some Java, to take a look. If you just want to play around with it, they also have some documentation of how to do so. So now we got to talk about the elephant in the room, which is the fact that very few of us are doing data unit testing. Uh, and uh, I love RuPaul's Drag Race, so I brought Jujubee along with me. OK. So if you need to write data unit tests, which we all should be doing, uh, we write unit tests for every other part of our code. And then we have the data pipeline code. We're like, ah, we write unit tests for the little bits that don't actually touch the data pipeline. And we're writing basically nothing for the data pipeline. Just like, ah, well, it, it finished, right? So it must be OK. Um, if you want to have the worst, most jerky code reviewer in the world, you should install Hypothesis. Um, it's awesome. Uh, and what Hypothesis does is it takes uh, some constraints that you write. So here it's a list of floats. And then it uses a search tree, and it tries to find ways to prove you wrong, which means it's a total jerk. Uh, and so here, this is from their documentation. It's really great. Uh, I was squinting at it for forever and actually had to read the explanation. But they found a falsifying example of a simple mean. Right? And we know that the min is going to be less than or equal to the mean, which is going to be less than or equal to the max. Well, hypothesis says, actually, you're wrong. And uh, it, it usually prints out quite a lot of information about why you're wrong. But in this case, uh, you're wrong because you're trying to divide infinity by a finite point. So we start to run into the constraints of using math in Python. right? Um, and so hypothesis is really great if you're dealing with normal Pythonic types, I highly recommend installing it and uh, having it code review for you. OK, if you're using pandas already and you want to uh, have a series of validation points that are essentially going to either throw warnings or exceptions when it sees data that does not fit those constraints, then you can use on guard. And uh, it's really great because you can also write your own decorators, essentially. So in this method, we're going to look, uh, is it, and this is not rational or irrational numbers, this is just, is, does it make sense? And in this case, they're comparing prices and times. So does, does your data make sense? If you're assuming it to come uh, synchronously and it sees a timestamp that's um, it from an older batch, then this is something that you can write a function to check. Uh, and then you can use simple decorators to do so. This is also going to check things like shapes, d-types. Um, there's a couple other really great built-ins. So if you're already using pandas in your data pipeline, this is a great thing to do. You will have to check with your team. Do we throw an exception? Do we throw a warning? How are we going to monitor uh, what's happening with OnGuard? But it's there for you to get started with rather than rolling your own. MyPy. So I think there's a talk later today or it might be tomorrow on MyPy. Um, I know people have mixed feelings about this. But uh, static typing, if you're working in data, is just a thing that you should probably appreciate and accept, um, except the new overlords. Uh, so PEP 484 right, is going to allow us for type hints. And it's really, really simple to write some statically type, typed hints. right? And you can, again, determine and set, what does this do? Um, are we going to throw exceptions every time we see something else? Is it going to be another thing that we do when we see um, that we have some bad types passing around. Um, it, I've 
heard, uh, I haven't done it myself, that it can be somewhat difficult to deal with MyPy with uh, NumPy and Pandas, but I think that's being worked on in terms of uh, checking proper types for NumPy and Pandas. Um, so I think that that's being worked on, and uh, I'm pretty sure they're probably open to pull requests if uh, you have some ideas on that. And then Faker. So Faker is really great for generating fake data. Um, what they have is they have a bunch of simple fake data, so names, uh, series of numbers, simple data types, uh, as well as they have your own uh, base provider. So one example idea is if you have a data set and it should always look in a similar way, then you can use Faker to fake, uh, fake for your unit tests. So if you always know you have you know, this tab stream or this tab separated document that you're using, you can use Faker, you build a base provider that essentially does mock data for you, and then at that point in time you can test uh, your data pipeline using that fake data. So, in summary, uh, data quality assurance matters. So you should use a checklist and make sure that you're going through and you're actually addressing these problems. You're not just assuming that because your report ran okay that everything's fine. Or that just because you know so much about the data that you're the expert that you, know, you don't need to go through a checklist and, and make sure that it makes sense. There's tons of open source tools and projects to help. Uh, a, a really big point for me is make sure that no one person on your team is the data janitor by themselves. It's an awful situation to be in. Uh, if you're working with a team and you're all using the data, then everybody should have a say and have a part uh, in the data pipeline and the cleaning process. Uh, if you have the opportunity to use machine learning, if your team's already using machine learning or you have a team where somebody can focus on that, then I suggest doing so. And make sure you're building data tests. So uh, a lot of times we're leaving this part out, um, but there's a lot of tools that you can utilize to help you with this. So I want to say thanks uh, for attending my talk. If you want to reach out, I have my email. Um, I'll be around today and tomorrow. Um, I'm doing a data wrangling workshop tomorrow that's aimed for the, an introduction to pandas, if you will. And uh, again, the book signing at 2 p.m. today, Ian and I. Um, so yeah, thanks again for talking, and I'll take any questions. the data cleaning pipeline, how is it called? Uh, which one was that? Uh, the, the continuous data cleaning yeah, one? Continuous. Yeah, it's called, the paper's called continuous data cleaning. Uh, I believe the researchers are now working with IBM, so I'm not sure if they'll open source that. Um, but uh, the paper's really interesting, and there's quite a few that are utilizing this kind of iterative approach where it's a clean, and then you essentially find the least confident results and then you prompt a user to do so. So the, the method is widely available to us, right, as, as open source enthusiasts. I have yet to find an actual open source framework that's doing that. But I do know that there's uh, quite a lot of uh, folks, in fact, Jeff is giving a talk uh, tomorrow on doing a similar type of thing with deep learning. And when you're saying, okay, hey, I have uh, image uh, extraction, and uh, how do I determine, okay, these are my least confident images uh, in terms of tagging, and then prompt a user to say, yes, they're correct, or no, it's these tags, actually. So. Okay, thank you very much. I'm afraid we have to stop there to let the next person get ready, but thank you very much indeed. Remember... <laughs>